Well, what's up? What's up? What's up? Hope you guys are well. Welcome to MyFi. Another great episode for you today with my friends, the Imaginaries, Shane and Maggie. Uh, awesome episode. Great conversation. I had a little technical issues, so we had to, you know, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes the interwebs are not as dependable as we would like, but we get through and we had a killer conversation. They are some of the busiest coolest people I've ever met. And uh, you're going to love the conversation. But wherever you are, hit subscribe, follow us on socials at MyFi Podcast everywhere. Um, and uh, and yeah, you know the drill. Hit subscribe on YouTube or Apple Podcasts. Y- y- y'all get it. Uh, and follow us on socials because we'll post clips and you know, whatnot. But the show's great today. You're going to love it. I promise. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, let's get into it. Oh, man. So glad to be here. Um, man, this this conversation was really cool with the imaginary Shane Henry, Maggie McClure. Um, they're actually a married couple and a duo. Um, they kind of talk about the story of how they came together, and I'll let them tell that because it's really fascinating and, and really awesome. Um, but it got me thinking this week about duos that I really love. You know what I'm saying? Maybe you have somebody's immediately coming to mind you know, when, when, when I say duo and I was trying to think like really outside the box, just a little, you know, it's not crazy. Like I'm some smart guy, but like, I was trying to think a little bit outside the box and go, okay, artists that I love groups. I love that are really only two people. What would I lean into? So, and, and I, I think I cheated at first a little bit because, uh, naturally when I think of like two people, I go, uh, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, because I'm a Stones guy. Keith Richards is my dude. He's my favorite guitar player of all time. One of my biggest inspirations. I'm a huge fan of the Rolling Stones. So I automatically think Richards, Jagger. You know, they wrote all those hit, those great Rolling Stones hits. I know they're tech. I know the Rolling Stones are a group, and and Ron Wood's awesome, and Mick Taylor was awesome, and Charlie Watts was awesome. You know, and 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 it was a group. I get it. But Richards and Jagger were the first thing that popped in my mind, and then obviously I go Lennon McCartney. You know, because it's amazing. If you haven't seen all the uh, the um, uh, the the Disney Plus uh, footage, um, man, I can't remember what it was called now. Um, but the Beatles documentary thing they did on on Disney Plus it was dope. It was it was great. Um, you should go watch it. Uh, you see the magic of Lennon and McCartney. Um, but I, I get that's not a duo either because they're in the Beatles and that's really four people. And trust me, George Harrison and Ringo were contributors there amazing in their own right. Um, and so anyway, real, real actual duos. I thought of three that I really, really dig and, uh, uh, were cool. Maybe you think of some more, maybe you've never, uh, or you haven't listened to these groups in a while or whatever. I don't know, but I thought this was cool. The first one was the white stripes, um, Meg and Jack white. Uh, I still don't know. Uh, I, I should have looked this up, but I still don't know if they were married or their brother and sister or what they were. You know, there's all these rumors that went around. I think they were married at some point and then got a divorce um, at some point too. But they made a bunch of killer records. And recently in the news, uh, some guy posted something about Meg White being a terrible drummer. And he got obliterated on social media <laughs> because uh, she's great. She's great in her own right. She's great. Um, for the white stripes that uh, I heard Jack White call her drumming like perfectly primitive one time. And I think that's exactly right. And the magic of the white stripes was the minimalism uh, that they wrote and played with. And I think that they were just phenomenal. Meg and Jack both. Jack White's one of the modern guitar heroes, you know, that we have in the sense that he is a riff writer. You know, I think of riffs that like when a riff gets big enough for high school bands to play it at football games, that riff is huge. You know what I'm saying? And I hear Seven Nation Army at every high school game uh, I go to. Uh, my son's in high school, so, and he's in the band, and so I go to a lot of them, and they play it all the time. So I think I think the White Stripes are way up there in terms of duos. Uh, next on the list, I had Tears for Fears, which I get, you know, they take a whole band out, but the guys in Tears for Fears are amazing. Um the uh, the songs from the Big Chair record had three massive hits on it, and there's only eight or nine songs on that record. And for three of them, you know, a, a, a third of that album to be massive top forty hits with "Shout," uh, "Head Over Head Over Heels." Was that was what was on that record? I'm like doing this off the cuff. I should have looked. Um, and uh, 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 everybody wants to rule the world. Huge songs. "Head Over Heels" may have been on another record. May have been another. I can't remember. I can't remember. But there were three big hits on that record. 
And Tears for Fears are awesome. If you never listened to them, they're still awesome. They just came out with a new record um, in early 2022 or late 2021. Uh, it's called The Tipping Point, and it is phenomenal. Tears for Fears are awesome. And lastly, uh, maybe my favorite duo of all time, Outkast. We can't forget the incredible hip hop duos uh, throughout the nineties and OOs and even into today, you know, I, I thought back to like, uh, duos, maybe lesser known hip hop duos in the, in the nineties, uh, like kid and play, you know what I'm saying? Um, but outcast is phenomenal, obviously at the aliens and Stankonia and, you know, speaker box love below. And they were just, they're pioneers. Uh, they're incredible artists, um, Andre and big boy, both. And, uh, they're a great, great duo. And so, uh, I thought about featuring a duo record today for record of the week. And I just wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't finding something that I hadn't already thought, you know, I featured an outcast record before I've talked about the tears for fears record before. And so I I didn't want to, I didn't want to bring up a white stripes record for whatever reason. And I tell you, I've been on a kick lately because you two dropped this album called, um, uh, surrender where they reimagine 40 of their songs and it's fantastic. Uh, I don't say that cause I'm a U2 guy, even though I am, it's just phenomenal. And you need to listen to the record. Um, there's a subsequent like documentary that David Letterman sort of um, hosts on Disney Plus as well. And I watched it. it was just super inspired. It's it's fantastic. And so you should watch the documentary. You should listen to the songs because they're just great. They recorded them all kind of stripped down. And there's just a whole lot of heart behind it. But I'll let you watch the documentary to figure that out. In lieu of that, my record of the week is U2, No Line on the Horizon, which I think is a, if, if you're watching on video, I'm holding it up, uh, 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 LP of it. Um, it's an underrated, underappreciated U2 album. Uh, it came out in 2019, it looks like, or that was when this press was, but that, that sounds about, about right. Um, I can't, honestly can't remember. I should do better at like preparing for all this stuff. Cause I just go off the cuff as a music fan. And that's always disastrous. Um, but this record is fantastic. Uh, the title track, No Line on the Horizon, is amazing, magnificent. Uh, there's a song on here called Breathe that's amazing. It was incredibly produced. And if you've never heard U2, no, and the artwork's just phenomenal. There's also Anton Corbin, who's a longtime friend of the band, did a like a um, kind of a uh, uh, like a, a symbolic film that goes along with all the songs on the record, but they're in a different order. And you can watch that on YouTube and stuff. It's really cool. So anyway, um, back to the duo thing, because I got the Imaginaries on the show today and we're going to get to it. They're a fantastic Americana sort of folk rock, a little bit of blues duo from Oklahoma City area, Oklahoma. Um, their husband and wife, Shaggy, uh, Shane Henry and Maggie McClure. I said Shaggy. Um, Shane Henry and Maggie McClure. They released their debut album in 2021. They recorded that record in Muscle Shoals. We talk a lot about Muscle Shoals on the episode. Uh, They just finished recording their second full-length album over in Muscle Shoals, and they're still working on that a little bit. They've had songs licensed all over TV shows. Uh, They just made their debut as film producers, um, and we talk about that. They have a a film on Netflix that they are in and that – Maggie got hired to write, obviously wrote with Shane, wrote the the soundtrack for the film, tons of songs for the film, and those songs are doing well. Shane has launched a, a brand new guitar effects company called Westerland Audio. Uh, their pedal, the one, is is uh, the Westerland one is uh, out now, and we talk about that a little bit. They're just busy, fantastic people. You can check out their social media at Imaginaries Band. Um, on all their social handles at Imaginaries Band or ImaginariesBand.com is their website. Uh, I'm going to link all this. I'll link the pedal company, um, their individual, you know, Instagram handles and all that stuff in the show notes. You guys can connect with them at every level. Uh, I'll link the Netflix movie. I'll, I'll, I'll do all that stuff in the show notes. So you don't even have to worry about that right now because, uh, you know, I'm just a nice guy. Uh, you know, I try to be anyway. Um, anyway, uh, you're going to love this conversation. I'm grateful they were on the show. I mentioned it a little bit. We had a little bit of technical difficulties uh, with inter- internet and stuff, but man, it just it's a great conversation, and I know you're going to love it. I uh, hope you enjoy the conversation I have with my friends, the Imaginaries. Hey, what's up, guys? Maggie, Shane, you guys doing well? Hey, hey doing great. How are you? Awesome. I'm doing, I'm doing well. Uh, I caught you guys at a busy season. You guys have so much going on. 
Oh my gosh. We yeah. do. It's very nice to finally connect with you and chat. It's been a whirlwind of a few months, but it's all good stuff. Totally. Yeah. I, I just saw, uh, I want to talk about the pedal company you just launched, uh, Shane. I want to talk, uh, you guys are film producers. Yeah. Uh, I read somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, and you just finished like the main core tracking for a new record. And this is all stuff I just know from social media and, yeah. you know, press releases and, and whatever, but you guys are some of the busiest people that I've ever talked to. So, um, <laughs> how was recording the new record? The posts from Muscle Shoals looked amazing. How, how was the new record recording? The new record was amazing. We, you know, we cut our last record there and, and Muscle Shoals is kind of how Maggie and I got our start making music together. Uh, back in 2018, nice. we had the opportunity to do this thing called the One Mic Series, which was, uh, we were selected as, as an artist to go do that. We had actually submitted our solo music at the time and come to find out they had, they only had one slot available. And so the guy who was putting it on, John Cunaberti, just called me and said, hey, could maybe you and Maggie do something together? And we said, yeah, we can do that. And so that's kind of how our band got started. So oh, wow. we have a lot of connection with Muscle Shoals. We got to go down and, re- and record this one mic series at the Jackson Highway Studio. And it was such a really refreshing fun musical experience um that we were very we were just really inspired we came home and we wrote a whole bunch of songs and we went back and made our debut record there in the fall of 2018 and so it just was kind of a a no-brainer for us to go back for this next chapter and see if we could strike that same magic again yeah so it went really well that's Um, fantastic we still have some work to do um and we might still do some recording um here in Oklahoma, but we uh, had a great time and we're off to a great start and really excited about the new songs. That's awesome. You guys are in Oklahoma now. Is that where both of you are from? Yeah, we're both from here. I grew up in the Chickasha area and Maggie grew up in Norman. Yeah. So we actually live in Norman now, but we're we're never home. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It doesn't seem like it. Yeah. Yeah. I have. Uh, I was telling you guys before we hit record. I have a lot of family in the Oklahoma City area, and so I've been there a lot and do some work with some companies and everything there. It, uh, Oklahoma City, and and I think Tulsa. I'll include there. I have some family there too, so I've been there a few times. I think Oklahoma City and Tulsa are really cool towns that don't get a a lot of or enough credibility in my mind for how cool they really are. Yeah, yeah. they really have come a long ways. I mean, back when Maggie and I moved to LA in in 2012, Oklahoma City was a different place. Uh, same with Tulsa. I think they've both really grown tremendously over the last decade. And yeah. there's definitely a lot more opportunities and music venues and stuff going on, you know? Yeah, the music so. scenes are very vibrant right now. We actually just played in Tulsa over the weekend and uh, it was a blast. And we also did a tour of the church studio, which we uh, would really like to record there as well. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Tulsa's awesome. That's awesome. Tulsa. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Every tour I see right now of almost any band stops in Tulsa, which yeah. 10 years ago, that was not the case. It was like a smaller yeah. market. It'd be like maybe a Tuesday night we would stop there if they just happen if, if it just happens to be connecting you from, you know, whatever major city to the next major city, but yeah, now I feel like uh, you know, people are definitely going to Tulsa and they're going to Oklahoma City now. So yeah, totally. Now, you guys growing up there, did you grow up in musical families? Did your parents uh, play or sing or brothers or sisters or whatever? Yeah, so I started performing as a toddler. Uh, my mom put me in dance when I was two, but nice. I started piano lessons when I was five. And um, since then, have you know been attached <laughs> at the hip with a piano And I was one of those strange kids who really liked to practice. And my mom would have to come get me and be like, okay, that's enough. (laughs) You know? And um, so I grew up in school, you know, in band, I played percussion. I was in my first rock band when I was 14. I played drums and sang with the head mic. And, um, you know, from there, it progressed on and on uh my mom always sang for fun she actually did sing in a band like a cover band um but not really professionally and my dad always tinkers around on the guitar um 
And my stepdad now, he he is a legit professional keyboard player, and he's actually how Shane and I met. So the music runs deep in my family. Oh, nice. Is that your family? Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, my dad was a guitar player and played in cover bands through college. Never really pursued music as a professional thing, but huge, I guess, musicologist and just fan of music in general. And just growing up, like he had a very vast vinyl record collection. And I remember being, you know, six years old, looking at Stevie Wonder's, you know, Songs in the Key of Life and all these cool records and getting lost in the vinyl artwork. And there was always music playing and I was always singing along. Um, I grew up in a kind of out in the country between Verdon and Chickasha, Oklahoma. And so really wasn't a lot of, I went to school in Verdon, which was is a really, really small town. Like graduating class had like 30 kids. So not a lot of music opportunities oh, wow. at school. We didn't have any music programs in, in my high school. You had two options. You could be in, you know, uh, was it FFA or, or you're, sports. or you're going to be in sports. One of the two, you know, and where there was no football, it was, it was baseball and basketball. Yeah. Only. And, you know, I started getting involved in playing, yeah. you know, I got, got interested in guitar when I was about 11 or 12 and quickly started learning chords and just decided I was like really into it. And I started playing like in the praise and worship band at church. And, and then from there, it was just like, I just decided it was what I wanted to do. My dad took me to see uh, Tom Petty and BB King and yes. like during one summer, I got to see Petty on the uh, Wildflowers tour and Tom Petty or, or oh my me, God. and BB King, the BB King Blues Festival tour. And so through those two like concerts, oh. I was like, this is what I want to do. You know, it was like, duh, you know? So I just went full blown, like by the time I was like 13 into music. So and that's amazing. Fun. Uh, yeah. Maggie, do you remember any like records that your family had around O'Shea you mentioned CV wonder? Was there anything that comes to mind as like the first time you heard music that you were just like, I have to do this. Yeah. I mean, we, my parents always had the oldie station on. Um, they loved the beach boys. I remember having beach boys in the house. Um, the Bee Gees, um, Vince Gill, Amy Grant. Um, those were some popular artists in the household. My dad always liked more country, more bluegrassy music. My mom a little bit more, um, you know, top forties. Um, but yeah, I think my first concert was actually Amy Grant when I was eight years old. And I remember going to that oh, and nice. being, being like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And, um, you know, through school, really dove into um, artists like Bonnie Raitt. She was one of the first uh, karaoke tapes that I got when I was um, in elementary school. I remember, you know, that slide <laughs> solo on let's give them something to talk about and just loving that sound. Um, Sarah McLaughlin was a huge influence for me as a kid. Um, my dad actually went to an auction for a charity and we bid and won on an autographed um, framed CD. And I was so excited. <laughs> it was awesome. And then years That's later, awesome. Shane took me to go see Sarah McLaughlin at the Greek theater. Uh, or what? No, it was the Santa Barbara or where was it? Santa Barbara bowl, Santa Barbara yeah. bowl, which yeah. I actually got to open for BB King there years later. So yeah. I had to take Maggie to check it out. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. It seems like you guys have similar musical upbringing as I'm sure that helps when you're like writing together and working together. Sure. And all yeah, that. we yeah. have similar, but also different. Yeah. I mean, stylistically, I think we listened to different stuff growing up. Like I got so into blues, like my dad was such a huge blues fan. I mean, it was always like, you know, BB King and Johnny winter and, you know, Albert King, yeah, mine too. And Captain. And I mean, you know, uh, cream Hendrix, all of that stuff was always playing in the house. So I just really, as when I, when I decided I wanted to get a guitar, it was, it started off on acoustic and then from there it went to electric and, you know, and it was always me uh, listening to those guys trying to figure out what they were doing, you know, and that was kind of my influence. So, you know, when I first started playing in a band when I was 16 and put my first band together, it was blues stuff. It was blues rock stuff, you know, so. Yeah. And yeah. I will say like yeah, in that my, my first, I was in a band, uh, an all girl band in high school and it was like our first serious band. I was the youngest. Oh, nice. I was 15 and we played 
every weekend we had a gig. And um, so at that time we were doing a lot of covers and, you know, incorporating our originals as we wrote them. Um, but we were doing like Jewel, uh, Fiona Apple, Michelle Branch, yeah, uh, Nora Jones, Bonnie Raitt, Sarah McLaughlin, of course, some Alicia Keys, some Coldplay, some Beatles. Um, so that's kind of where wow. my influences were in high school and college era. That's awesome. And so I guess, uh, I guess it is different. Like you guys both grew up family, uh, families, um, musical, you know, uh, playing music around the house and playing instruments as well. Um, you seem to work together and I don't know, I was racking my brain cause in the show opening, uh, uh I talk a little bit about m- some of my favorite duos, you know, in, in, uh, music history and, it's amazing to me. I I was racking my brain. It's really hard to think about husband wife duos. Like yeah, I mean, there, I, there's I, a lot of them that start off that way, but don't last. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you guys dynamic like I. Oh, say that. Say that again, Maggie. Oh, I just said, or they're not together, and then they end up together, and it breaks up the band. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I mean, what's that dynamic like? I mean, I watch YouTube videos of you guys uh, playing together and writing together and behind the scenes stuff and social media stuff. And like, it just seems like you guys have such an awesome, obviously marriage, but like a, a musical chemistry too. We and really I just, do. I feel like that's really rare. It is. And I'll tell you this, that like that musical chemistry didn't actually happen overnight. It was something that gradually happened for Maggie and I, because, you know, our stylistically, we were stylistically very different, you know, but when we started dating early on, like I want to say around 2005 or 2006, um, you know, we started playing shows together where I'd have an acoustic show and she would sit in and sing with me or maybe play keys. And then as time went on, you know, she'd have a show and need a guitar player and I'd play guitar with her. And so we kind of started collaborating with each other, like, as, as utility men in each other's bands, you know, so to speak. And then, um, wow. around, I want to say like 2008 or nine, she had the opportunity to do a showcase for this thing called NACA, which was like the, uh, where you could go showcase and book a bunch of shows at colleges across the country. And it was kind of in the era when they were booking a lot of singer songwriters, you know, and it's like, you'd get paid great to go yeah. play at college, but maybe four people would show up to hear you play. But <laughs> so what, you know, you're, you're going to go to Pennsylvania and make 2,500 bucks on a Tuesday night, you know, you're going to do it, you know? And yeah. she realized right away after she booked like 60 gigs and was about to pack the van up and hit the road by herself that she didn't really want to go by herself. So she asked me if I could come and play guitar. And I was like, yeah, we worked it out, you know? And so um, that was kind of the early way that we started really getting chemistry was just by repetition, by playing together, by singing together. And, and at that time, honestly, like I had never sang harmony with another vocalist because I was always a lead singer in my band. And Maggie was naturally a great harmony wow. singer because she grew up singing harmony in church. So, you know, we she stretched me in that regard. I think we just got those hours in. And then just over time, you know, that led to, you know, fast forward, you know, when we moved to L.A. in 2013, we started writing more together. Uh, for our records at that time, we started collaborating more in the studio and then it was just kind of, yeah. And then of course, eventually we, yeah, we wrote a holiday single together and put it out. And then I think just over time, we eventually started collaborating more and we realized that, that we could work together, but it's on, it's honestly like really still kind of funny that the opportunity of being on this thing called the one mic series, which um, was kind of how our band started. We, we had been living in a house in Burbank, California. This was like 2017. Our house had black mold and we had to move out. And we went to stay at a friend of ours. Oh, wow. house. His name is Devin Powers. And while we were there, he said, hey, my friend is doing this thing called the One Mic Series and he's looking for bands. And I think you and Maggie's music would be perfect. Can I submit it? And we said, sure, you know. And we didn't hear anything for like, you know, a week or two. Then he finally calls me up. And his name is John Cunaberti. He is a phenomenal mixer and engineer uh, most notably worked a lot with like Joe Satriani and different people in the Bay area. But he, uh, he called us and he said, oh, Hey wow. guys, he said, I love your music, but I have one problem. He said, I've booked up the whole entire, you know, season for the one mic series, but I would like 
you know, to feature you both, can you do something together? And so we kind of took that opportunity to go to Muscle Shoals and we said, yeah, we'll do something together. And we had already written some songs that really didn't fit our own solo mm-hmm. projects. And it just kind of began this thing of trying something new and we just were open-minded and we went down there and, and cut these two songs, which were revival and thinking about you, which are on our debut record. But it was such a unique experience yeah. and it was refreshing mm-hmm. that we got really creative and decided to write a record. And that's kind of the start of our band. That's how we decided to finally start, you know, taking it from just playing with each other and, you know, the next Backing step, each other yeah, up. writing songs. And now we just decided mm-hmm. to start a band. So, yeah, yeah but we, we started writing songs together when I was 19. Um, we had our first co-write with uh, Kevin Bo up in Minneapolis and, um, that was the first time we co-written and we came from such a different backgrounds of writing. I mean, honestly, I had not written with many other people. I was always the one who wanted to write every song that I performed a hundred percent, but Shane really opened my eyes to the world of co-writing and now I love it. And it took us a while. Yeah, I mean, for at that time, like songs for you were like your diary and yeah. they were like very personal. It was like, if it wasn't something yeah. personal to you, you weren't singing it and writing about it. And, you know, I, I was signed to a label when I was, you know, 19 years old. And they said, we really like you. You're a good guitar player and singer, but your so- some of your songs are good, but you need better songs. And so they were the ones who pushed me mm. to like start co-writing with other people. And that's, of course, how I met Kevin Bo and, mm-hmm. you know, Jeff Silbar and all these great songwriters. Yeah. So. But the dynamic of us, you know, being married and doing this together, it is really special. And I think I agree. It is rare. You don't see it a lot. And it's really cool for us because we both, you know, have been the lead person in our band, our own bands for years. And this has been really fun for us to share that spotlight, share that responsibility and, you know, let Shane step up, let me step up and just have fun and do something new together. And it's been a really, really fun ride so far. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, it is really unique to me and something that uh, watching the YouTube videos and I watched some of the, um, there was like a Christmas stream and some things I went back and watched uh, of you guys. It's interesting to watch a band and there, there are artists like this um, that I, that I've noticed, but very few where you have two, maybe even three people sometimes in the band who uh, are in the group who have the confidence to be the front person, but they choose at times to play another role Mm -hmm. And you get to see not only their confidence, but their humility. And the dynamic of that is something new, emotional. It's not, it's not something that you experience. Oftentimes it's a band with a front person and they have all the bravado and the, and the ego and the confidence and all that sort of stuff to carry the room. But to see that dynamic to it, it really is something that's unique and special. And I, you know, the records are great. It's funny that you mentioned um, Revival. That was one of the songs I wrote down that I was like, man, this, this is a really great song. That one kind of captured my attention. It's funny. That was one of the first ones you guys uh, worked on together. Yeah. Um, but the music's just so raw, so cool. Is is the new record, is it a little bit in that vein? I'm sure that you guys have evolved, but can like yeah. people who got into the first record or who've been watching the YouTube stuff, can they expect a, you know, a little more of the same, not in a, a mundane sense, but just knowing who you guys are as writers and performers? Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like it is an extension of the first record for sure. We're definitely taking some new chances in a few places, but... Um, it's definitely a, a, a connection, an extenuation mm-hmm. of that sound, that natural sort of just organic raw sound. And that's kind of what we want to do with this band. You know, we don't want it to sound like it's overdubbed to death. We want to gr- catch a sure. great take playing with the band in the studio. And that's the song, you know, and then yeah. of course we'll build on that track. And if we need to add a B3 or whatever we do it, but trying to keep that raw, you know, honest energy is mm-hmm. kind of our goal. Yeah. It's always been important to us to, stay true and be authentic to who we are as people and as artists. And yeah, you know, this, this band from the beginning, we knew that it needed to be not overdubbed to death, not produced to death. And, um, you know, it's easy to do that. And especially when you have a home studio and have all the stuff to do it with. Um, (laughs) but we, it's really important to us to keep it raw, keep it real and capture that energy of everyone playing together. And that's what's so special about us um, going to Muscle Shoals is 
the studio that we recorded at. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We, we actually, you know, we set up in a circle. And so the drummer's in a booth. So there's not bleed over with the drums. But everybody else is on the main floor looking at each other and playing the track down. Of course, you know, bass is going direct. And then the electric guitar player, uh, I was playing acoustic on a lot of the tracking session for the new record, electric on some. And, you know, we were able to sort of do all that in a room and just capture a great take. And who cares about bleed over? You know, it doesn't really matter. That's it was on all the old records that we all love. You know what I mean? I think we get in this mindset when we're yeah. making records that everything has to be so pristine and beautiful and perfect, but the rawness and a little bit of, uh, looseness sometimes makes it feel more honest and more heartfelt. So that's mm-hmm. what we were going for. We were going to capture the emotion and essence of the songs and, uh, you know, not worry about everything else. So. Yeah. Yeah. And not adding too many things, you know, it's really about the songs and it's about our connection. And those are the most important elements to us and everything else just kind of supports that. Yeah. That's a, that's a special town for that vibe too. I mean, there's a lot of people who know, but if you're a listener and you don't know, Muscle Shoals is a historic uh, music community in Florence, Alabama, and what surrounds it is just amazing. And there's a lot of great studios there and a lot of history. I'm a Stones guy, so knowing like mm-hmm. Brown Sugar was recorded there and, you know, stuff like that, I, I just, I nerd out so, so hard. Clean, there's a documentary man. about Muscle Shoals that it's just fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that meant a lot to you guys being there, starting there, doing the first record there, coming back for the second record there. Are there bands from the musical history of Muscle Shoals that you guys vibe with, connect with? Hmm. Well, I mean, we're fans of, you know, so many of the bands that recorded and worked there. Um, a lot of people um, these days are recording over at uh, Fame. Um, some of the records that we saw there, of course, Jason Isbell. Oh yeah. Um, just, everybody cuts down there, but I mean like from, as far as the historic, you know, people that cut there, I mean, Edda, you know, Etta James, of course, or, of course, Aretha, the love Stones. them both, the Stones. I mean, and a lot of that music is just so honest, you know, it's yeah. so heartfelt, raw, real, and has a vibe, you know, it's so funny you mentioned that because when we were down there, I don't know if you can see this or not, but I took a picture of this. This is actually the sheet from when, um, the receipt. The receipt from the session of cutting brown. Uh, brown sh- oh yeah, I think uh, I think you posted that on social. I did. I did, and it's amazing. It was like you know, cost them. You know, they they which one was this? Oh, this was this was a different song. There's brown so sugar. brown sugar cost them nine hundred eighty dollars, and it took them twelve hours to cut that song of studio time. And you know, they had to have five one inch reels of tape that cost them forty bucks a reel. It's two hundred dollars. Total of, oh oh, excuse me, $780 in studio time, a total of $980 to cut brown sugar. Now that was a great investment right there. <laughs> God, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Worth, worth a hundred times over <laughs> or thousands at this point. Y- yeah, for real, for real. Uh, yeah. I just think that's great that you guys ma- make your way down there and have so much connection. Uh, yeah. And that uh, town. yeah, um, for sure. Oh, yeah, no, go ahead. You, you were going to say something. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, there's not any artists that we, you know, don't enjoy their music who have worked there. Honestly, I mean, so many people have worked there. I mean, gosh, Wilson Pickett, you know, I mean, there's so many greats that have cut yeah. there. And of course, you know, like, you know, like I said, Isbell and, you know, uh, Drive By Truckers. And there's so much, just so much diverse, great music there. And I mean, of course, everybody's going there now uh, just because they find out about the little the secret that it is, you know, it's a, it's a special community. There's great Mm -hmm. musicians there and there's still like, you know, some of the second generation swampers. Like we had Kelvin Holly played guitar or electric guitar on our project. And he played on the last one as well. And Kelvin, Kelvin played guitar with little Richard for like 30 years and is a studio musician and just brings such a unique, uh, you know, just interesting parts to the table. And, Mm -hmm. and then, uh, on this last session, we thought it'd be really fun to, to get David hood to come down and play bass on a song. And we met David the last time we were recording, but he, he had had just had back surgery. So he wasn't able to play on anything, but he's doing great. And he came Mm -hmm. in and played on one song for this, for the session, which was really fun. Um, We were thinking about a song to do with him and we were staying in the Airbnb that we had rented down there. And I looked up on the wall and his pictures right there next to shares. 
because you know Cher cut one of her first solo records. They in were in a picture Shoals. together. Yeah, they were in a picture together. <laughs> and uh, um, sorry, that's what I'm to say. Yeah, it was an album cover actually for one of her records. And so I told Maggie, I said, wouldn't it be cool if we we did a a, a modern day version of "I Got You, Babe" and had David Hood play bass on it? So we did that. We did a fun cover of that. So, oh, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Just- it's That's a special amazing, man. place. I mean, there's something about Muscle Shoals. It's just really slow. There's absolutely zero stress, zero pressure, which you don't get that in pretty much every other, you know, music town. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just a really special place, and it's easy to let go and kind of just really take your time, which is really nice to have that when yeah. you're making a record and don't feel like we're on the clock and we got to do this. And, you know, people are like, Oh, it's okay. We can stay as long as you need, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, just that Southern ho- hospitality and just kind of slow pace is really refreshing. Yeah. That opens up a lot. I feel like for a creative person where when you don't feel rushed, you, sometimes there's an urgency that creates something and I get yeah. that, but oftentimes when you don't feel rushed and the vibe is cool and the community's good and there's good people there, it like pulls the best out of you. Cause you just feel comfortable and confident. And so, you yeah. know, who you're surrounded by and where you are really matters, you know, when you're, when you're making stuff like that. Definitely. 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 Yeah. Hey, I want to make sure I get to the Netflix thing because yeah. that, that snuck up on me. I, wow. I watched I watched the YouTube stuff, checked out the records, and I turned around I'm like, you guys are film producers on a Netflix show? Like, yeah, man. I mean, this is how, crazy. how did all that come about? Well, you know, I just had mentioned we lived in LA for almost seven years. We moved back home in yeah. early 2018 after living in a house that had black mold. And so we took that as a suggestion that we were supposed to come back home and start a new chapter of our life. We were both kind of ready to be able to tour and be a little bit more centrally located. And LA is just getting so expensive to live in anyways. I think it was a blessing in disguise. I sure wouldn't have wanted to be there during the pandemic, but um, yeah, so we got, we got back home. We started the imaginaries. We were finishing up the record. All that stuff happened. The pandemic hit. Well, this, this uh, writer and director that Maggie had connected with that we'd worked with on previous films approached her in 20, 2020 and had a script mm-hmm. and sent it over in around October of 2020 and yeah. said, I would love to get you involved to write songs for this movie. And so, and I wrote roles for you and yeah. shame in the movie and I'd love for you to help me make it happen. Yeah. So, so she did, <laughs> we yeah. did. And it was awesome. You know, it was the perfect time for something like that. Um, we couldn't tour. Uh, we were, you know, we had, we were stuck in, in the studio and we're like, well, what better thing to do than write songs for a movie. So it was really cool. we, ended up writing and producing the whole soundtrack, which is 11 songs. And almost all of them are performed on camera in the film. So it's called The Cowgirl Song, and it nice. came out on Netflix in August. And so it's on Netflix right now, which is really cool. So you can see me and Shane. Yeah. Uh, and all the songs that we did. And- Man, I'll never forget coming home. During the, during the pandemic, I actually was – working on my musician backup plan, I bought some real estate and had worked on converting it for, to, to Airbnbs and fixing it up and renovating it. And I remember coming home one day and, Mag- and walking through the back door. Maggie goes, so guess what? We're writing all the songs for a movie and we're going to be in it. And I go, huh? <laughs> and it happened, you know, yeah. it was cool. I mean, I took some acting classes because I was scared to death, but you know, you realize that it's not really that much further of an extension from being a musician and being in front of people we're already acting to a certain extent, performing, talking to people. And you realize that you're going to get 25, 30 takes to do that scene. You can probably get a good one in. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Except when you're borrowing the ambulance and for, the, for the ambulance scene, uh, we did one or two takes. Oh yeah. Two takes. And then my they, first scene. they were like, uh, sorry guys, we're getting a call. We've got to go, uh, save somebody. And we're like, okay, that's it. <laughs> so we got two takes of the, ambulance. Uh, yeah. that's hilarious so it was like a lot like they were they were working at the time yeah we had i mean it was shot in a small town where i grew up Chickasha, oklahoma is the town that everything was shot in 
And, you know, we were at, it was a small budget film. I mean, the, the budget on the film was like just a little over 700,000. And so, I mean, that is a very tight budget for shooting for 20 yeah. days, 16, or 16 days. days. And so a lot of favors were asked, you know, and of course when a small wow. town gets a movie made there, everybody wants to help be a part of it. So we were borrowing yeah. all that stuff. You know, they, they were allowing us to use it, but there the, are only the, ca- two. <laughs> the caveat was if we have to use it, we have to use it. So, <laughs> So we ended up going back and shooting a few more scenes at a different location to kind of make it work. So that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You guys was, seem to have like a, so, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it was a really cool experience for us and a, you know, the perfect time for that to happen. And, um, you know, we hope to do more. We sure learned a lot. I mean, we learned a lot as musicians, um, how to collaborate on songwriting with, people who are not songwriters or musicians. Um, it helped us as music producers, you know, producing a little bit more country style music for this film. Um, we learned a lot as film producers. Um, what that actually means is when something, when an emergency happens, which is about every five minutes, um, you figure out how to take <laughs> care of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, of course, we learned a lot as actors as well. Like Shane said, we had a coach who worked with us for a few weeks leading up to filming. Um, but the beauty, the beautiful thing about that was we didn't have time to freak out. Everything just had to happen, and we had to do it and get it done. So there was no time to be nervous or worry about anything because it was just all happening. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's refreshing sometimes as a creative person to do something different. Mm -hmm. Um, As a musician, you know, you guys have made a lot of music. And so there's expectations that what you put out is going to be great. And so, you know, you have to deliver. But as first time actors, nobody has any expectation for you. So you kind of get to learn and, and, and just experience things. And so I'm sure that was super cool. Yeah, Yeah, it was was really Really fun. And uh, we're, hoping to do more soon, working on it, but haven't committed to any projects, but there's a lot going on. So hopefully we'll get to do some more soon. Uh, tell us what's happening with the new record. When, when can we expect the new record to come out? Uh, are you doing vinyl? Is there a tour? Like what's, what's going on around the new record? So we are in the very beginning stages, honestly, of this whole new record cycle. So we have Um, some more recording to do before we really know. But our plan is starting in May at some point, we are going to be releasing one single at a time. So every six weeks or so, our goal right now is to release one single at a time leading up to the album release, which will hopefully be early next year. Now we are unsigned right now. We have no agent, no manager. So all of it, you know, booking the shows, getting, you know, it distributed, all of the plans lie on our shoulders. Um, We're currently looking for people to collaborate Mm -hmm. with um, as well. So hopefully as we release one single at a time, we might be able to um, connect with some labels and managers and agents that might be able to hop on board and help us get this thing going down the road. Um, but we are really excited and we've done this before on our own and we're, you know, more than willing to put in the work and do it again. So we do plan on touring the album when it comes out and probably, you know, we'll be touring this fall throughout the single releases. Um, so definitely stay tuned for tour dates um, for this fall and next year, but our big goal is to get on uh, an opening slot um, with a larger act. You know, we've we've booked it before yeah. on our own, and we know that it's possible. Um, so that's one of our main goals for this next year or two. So um, that's the plan. We'd love to do vinyl. We haven't ever done it before. We're gonna do it this time. <laughs> nice. And you guys have some shows coming up. Uh, uh, in California, like with Nam and some other stuff too. You want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah. We're going to be at Nam. Uh, that is going to be on April thirteenth, mm-hmm. and we're playing at seven p.m. on the Marriott stage. And then we got some other shows yeah. in Southern California nice. as well. Yes, on April sixteenth, we're playing a duo show uh, with our dear fr- 
friend Shane Alexander in Altadena at the Coffee Gallery backstage. Um, so that's going to be a really fun show. And um, then we're headed back out to Nashville May 1st. We're doing a writer's night there. So, yeah, we're back on the road uh, nice. in, in between finishing this album. <laughs> Nice. And, and like I said earlier, you guys are super busy. And I mentioned at the start of the show, um, Shane had a guitar effects company that just launched the first pedal in the line. Like what was the inspiration behind all that too? You guys literally, you have so much going on. It's unbelievable. Man, well, I don't Maggie's understand how you busy. find time to make Maggie, it all happen. Maggie is the busiest person I've ever met and the most driven person. So I thought I needed to meet my match and step up, <laughs> step up my game a little bit. No, just kidding. Um, so about 10 years ago, uh, Maggie's stepdad, Jim, who happened to be my first keyboard player in my band when I first started playing music and is how Maggie and I met. Um, he is now married to her mom. Mm -hmm. And so it's like all a music connection, you know, is how we met each other. And wow. anyways, he built a really cool pedal for me 10 years ago for a Christmas present. And then he started doing mods on pedals for other people and started building a lot of one-off guitar pedals. And he had been a guitar player for years. And as you know, we're always looking for the Holy Grail. We're always trying to push, push the limits and, uh, and try to dial in a sound we're hearing in our head. And he, he had built a drive pedal for me and it was really, really good, but it also had some things it didn't do that I wanted him to try to make it do. And through the course of about four years and 30 failed circuits, we landed on a really unique pedal that makes your amp sound like a very lively cranked tube amp. It doesn't color your tone. And I thought it was really great. And I also thought that other players would like it and, and be inspired by it because it really inspires my, my playing. So we sort of set off to start this pedal company and try to put it out there for, for other guitar players, you know, and it's really exciting. It's fun. It's been challenging, but I think we're off to a good start. You know, we, we really have taken our time to, to get the pedal right. And then it's just sort of educating others as to what it does and what it doesn't do. And, uh, you know, right now we've got this a really cool. Well, first of all, we've got two really great guitar players. David Ryan Harris is using one, and he's John Mayer's guitar player. Nice. And then also we've got Vince Gill using one on tour with the Eagles right now. So that's nice. a really great stamp of approval that that our pedal is meeting other yeah. standards. Yeah, so it's really cool. That's awesome. And do you have plans for uh, the next pedal already? Or are you just like seeing how this one does and then kind of making plans after the fact? Yeah, we do. We actually have a couple of things that we're already working on that are prototypes. Um, we're, we're kind of moving it. We're, we're going to take it, you know, one step at a time, see, see what the response is to this first sure. pedal. But um, our, our goal is to probably uh, lead out with a fuzz pedal is going to be the next one on the, in the, in the line. So we already have a yes. really cool, unique fuzz that we, that we really like. So we'll see those plans could change. And um, yeah. Yeah. And we're also looking. That's to, awesome. We're, we're looking at working with guitar players on their own signature pedals as well and building ones that they, you know, may have had a dream and not found it yet. Just kind of like what Shane did with the mm -hmm. Westerland. He knew what he wanted and it took a long time and many trials and errors to get it right. And now that we have it, it's really like his Holy grail. And, you know, Jim, my stepdad is so smart and so good at all of this. You know, it's our goal to also be able to go to guitar players and say, what's your dream pedal, you know, and build for them as well. That's fantastic. Uh, I, I watched some demos, you know, I follow the Instagram account for Westland audio and I'll post the links to the pedal stuff and the Netflix show and some YouTube and all that sort of stuff in the show notes. And so if you guys have never heard the imaginaries music, or you want to check out the pedal company, all that, you can check out the show notes. Um, 
And just to mention, you know, Instagram is at Imaginaries Band. Um, Imaginariesband.com is their website, so you can find everything like shows and all that sort of stuff, you know, connect with everything they got going on there as well. And there's links to the Netflix stuff and all the TV shows they've had stuff, you know, synced for and all that sort of stuff because they have a ton going on. But uh, I always get to ask people this question, so I want to make sure I get to you guys. You get you get three records to listen to for the rest of your life. What are they? Ooh. <laughs> okay, I know two right off the top of my head. Um, Tom Petty's Wildflowers. All right. Um, uh, Jeff Buckley yes. Grace is probably one of my other favorites. And, man, I don't know. I'll have to really think on that third <laughs> one. There's so many great records. Um, I'm going to say uh, Carol King, Tapestry. Um, that Thing You Do soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually really great. <laughs> <laughs> that would keep you in a good mood yeah, if you yeah. had records to listen to. Man, I used to be all I, – I used to listen to soundtracks like crazy. Um, I think it's kind of sad how Speaking they Speaking of soundtracks, have you, have, you, have you listened to the soundtrack for Daisy Jones and the Six? Oh, man. Have you checked that out yet? No, it's, it's in my queue to watch. Okay, no, okay. it's in my queue to watch. I haven't listened to it, it yet because I want to do it well, at the same time I watch the show. Maggie and I are the real, real da- modern day Daisy Jones and the Six because we're actually married and in a band together. <laughs> but the soundtrack is phenomenal, and it was nice. Produced, it's produced by Blake Mills, and if you know who Blake Mills is, he's a phenomenal guitar player and producer. So, oh yeah, yeah. I don't know what my third one is. Yeah, um, he he's actually. Oh, I was going to say Blake Mills is actually playing a show, I think, in Atlanta this weekend with Pino Palladino from John oh, wow. Mayer's band yeah. Um, yeah. At, ter- at Terminal West, which is just insane. I would love to go see it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing. <laughs> we would love to go see that, too. Yeah, the music from that show is yeah. really cool. <laughs> We're thinking about covering a song. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's very fitting. Yeah, for real, for real. Well, man, listen, thank you guys so much. Uh, this has been insightful and fun and all this, all that sort of stuff. And like I said, go go check out the Imaginaries music. It's obviously amazing. They've been all over the place. You've got a new record coming out. Um, check out the Netflix show. Check out the Pedal Company. Check out all this stuff. Um, we love talking about – you guys have such a wide array of artists. Uh, one thing I always do is list all the artists that we mention as influences or inspirations, you know, throughout the show. And uh, so I'll put all that stuff in the show notes. And, uh, man, thank you guys. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Shane, for being on the show. Yeah, thanks. I, I think I landed thank on my, my third record would be uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan's oh. Texas Flood. Oh. Because i got to have a blues rock record in there, you know. Yeah, yeah, very nice choice. Yeah, Yeah. and also we love (laughs) Alison Krauss and Robert Plant and their records. So good. Yes, totally. I'll add those to the show notes as well. But thank you guys again for being on the show. It was was a pleasure. Thanks for having us, Lee. We appreciate it, man. We hope to see you next summer in Atlanta, too. Yeah, absolutely. Y'all have a good one. Thank you. You too. Man, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Shane and Maggie are just such sweet people. Uh, and I can't wait for the record. Um, I want to get my hands on one of those pedals. Y'all know me. You see all these guitars behind me if you're on there. I love guitar. I love playing. I want to get my hands on one of those overdrive pedals and, and check her out. Uh, I want to check out the Netflix doc, uh, not documentary, the Netflix movie that they were part of as well. and All that sort of stuff. Uh, I hope you love the conversation. Make sure you follow them at Imaginaries Band on Instagram and their social stuff. And then imaginariesband.com is their website. You can connect to everything they're doing from the from the website. That's the best place to, to go. Uh, make sure you check it out. They got a record coming out. Um, like Maggie mentioned, you know, there's going to be singles that start dropping soon. And uh, yeah. Yeah, just great, great folks, great music, and uh, they got a lot going on, so make sure you keep up with it. Make sure you follow MyFi on social media as well. Uh, You can also follow myself, at Lee T. Baker. Um, You can check out the MyFi website at myfipodcast.com. Our social handles are are all at MyFi Podcast everywhere, YouTube. We're on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, obviously. Uh, so make sure that you subscribe wherever you're at so that you you know get all the updates and whatnot. We have some killer shows coming up in April and May. We've already booked it. It's a done deal. Got some killer people on the show. It's going to be great conversations about music and how it influences and inspires people and all the cool stuff that these creative folks got going on. You know what I'm saying? So till next time, Have a good one.